Have I ever read the Bible? No. I haven't read the Bible. For my own reasons, no. I've skimmed it. I have read the Bible. I kind of looked at little segments, but I've never actually attempted to read, read the whole thing. <laughs> it's not advertised enough, like I don't go to church, so the time when I do read it is when I'm in church, but other than that, like, I don't have a copy of the Bible. They're interesting stories, like as a guide for people how to live, not necessarily taken literally. I thought it was daunting. It's just, it's been a long time, so I don't really remember everything. The story of Adam and Eve. Yeah, Adam and Eve. Like the stories about uh, Jesus and his life. Up there, of course, there's Genesis. I don't know the difference between sort of like the different books and stuff, um, but I do know Genesis is the first one. Or is that an argument? I don't know. <laughs> My father was 49 when he got married. So I think I was around the age of 21, and he was about 73, when he told me that he wanted to go and see Russia before he died. At that time, it was the Soviet Union, and I had recently become a Christian, and I knew that it was very hard to be a Christian in Russia. There were very few churches that weren't banned, and Bibles were pretty much disallowed, and it was very hard to get hold of a Bible in Russia. So I thought, well, this is an opportunity to take some Bibles into Russia. I'll smuggle some Bibles into Russia. So I wrote to an organization which I knew smuggled Bibles, and I said, I'm going into Russia. Here's some money. Please, could you send me some Bibles, and I'd like to take them into uh, with me. And I got a reply which said, so sorry, uh, it's illegal to take Bibles into Russia. We can't supply you with them, and we recommend that you don't take any. That was the official reply. The following day, on the doorstep, there was this brown paper package with the Russian Bibles in it. So, feeling like James Bond 007, we set off and uh, I thought, right, I've got to give these to people who are real Christians. So I went to one of the very few churches that was uh, allowed. And I, I knew there would be lots of spies there, so I looked for somebody who I thought looked like a genuine Christian. And I saw this man who was in his 60s, and I had a radiant face. I followed him out of church. I followed him to a totally isolated spot. And uh, then I got out of my, uh, I just pulled out of my, my jacket this whole Russian Bible on very thin paper, uh, and I handed it to him. His face was just a picture. He took out of his pocket a New Testament that was totally threadbare. It had been read over and over again. It was probably 100 years old. Lots of the pages were missing. When he saw a whole Russian Bible, he was so excited. He was jumping up and down with joy. He didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Russian. But we were hugging each other and just celebrating there on the, the streets. Why was he so excited? For many people today, they think, a Bible, that's so dull, it's boring, it's kind of uh, full of contradictions, it's just a rule book, no relevance to my life in the 21st century. So why was he so excited? Do you know the Bible is the most popular book in the world? It's the most successful literary creation of all time. Every year, over 100 million Bibles are sold or given away. So it's the bestseller this year. It was the bestseller last year. It's the bestseller every year. In fact, practically every week, the Bible is the bestseller. If it was put into bestseller lists, every week it would be the Bible. That's why they didn't put it in. It would be so boring. Every, what's the bestseller this week? The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. It's the most popular book in the world. It's the most powerful book in the world. One former prime minister described the Bible as like high explosive. I've told you before, it had a profound effect on my life. It changed my life reading the Bible. It's the most precious book in the world. The psalmist describes the words of God as being more precious than gold. The queen at her coronation was handed a copy of the Bible with these words. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing which this world affords. Why? 
Well, Jesus said this, people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus says this, material things alone don't satisfy. Even the best human relationships don't ultimately satisfy. There's always this, what you might call a spiritual hunger, which can only be satisfied by something spiritual. And Jesus says that is the words that come out of God's mouth. And the primary way in which God communicates with us is through this book. God has spoken. It's his revelation. Sometimes people say, if there's a God, why doesn't he show himself to us? Why doesn't he reveal himself? And the answer is, he has. God has revealed himself, first of all, in creation. The fact that we're here. The fact that there's something rather than nothing. The fact that this universe is so amazing and finely tuned. The fact that there is this hunger in every human heart that searches after God. But supremely, God has revealed himself in a person. We've looked at that. He's revealed himself in Jesus. That's the ultimate revelation of God. But how do we know about Jesus? We only know about Jesus because of this book. The New Testament, of course, is all about Jesus. And the Old Testament, actually, when you look at it through the lens of Jesus, is also about Jesus. So, science is the exploration of how God has revealed himself in creation. That's why science is so amazing and so exciting. And theology is the exploration of how God has revealed himself in Jesus, in the Bible. So there should be no conflict between science and faith. Albert Einstein, one of the greatest scientists of all time, said this, a legitimate conflict between science and religion cannot exist. Religion without science is blind. And science without religion is lame. We need both. Science answers the how and when questions. The Bible answers the who and why questions. And the Bible is inspired by God. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, all scripture is inspired by God. Put it very simply. This is an oversimplification. But you could put it like this. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. Here's an example. All Scripture is inspired by God. It seems to be the Word of God. When you read it, it's kind of got a ring of truth. And then then it proves to be the Word of God. If you put it into practice, you find this really is God. God has spoken. Pope Francis, in the first official document that he's produced as Pope, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, says this about the Bible. We do not blindly seek God or wait for him to speak to us first, for God has already spoken and there's nothing further that we need to know which has not been revealed to us. Let us receive the sublime treasure of the revealed word. All scripture is God breathed. That's the literal translation of the word inspired by God. Of course, there were human authors. Over a period of 1,600 years, there were at least 40 authors. There were kings, poor people, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, doctors. They wrote different types of literature, such as history, poetry, prophecy, letters. So it is 100%. This book is 100% 
human authors. But it claims to be 100% inspired by God. How can that be? St. Paul's Cathedral was built by Sir Christopher Wren, the greatest English architect of his time. He started at the age of 43 in 1675, and for 36 years, the cathedral was built under one architect. It was completed in 1711, when Christopher Wren was 79 years of age. Sir Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral. But actually, he didn't lay a single stone. There were stonemasons, carpenters, builders, many people involved over a long period of time. But Sir Christopher Wren was the inspiration behind it all. So it is with the Bible. There are many different writers, one architect, one inspiration behind it all, God himself. That doesn't mean to say there are no difficulties. If you've ever tried reading the Bible, in particular the, the Old Testament, you'll come across things and you say, Ah, oh, this is shocking. There are moral difficulties, there are historical uh, difficulties, there are apparent contradictions, there are all kinds of stuff. And you say, how can this be inspired by God? It's a bit like suffering and the love of God. All Christians, to be a Christian, you have to believe that God loves us. That's the heart of what Christianity is about, the love of God. But then you look at the world and you see this a massive amount of suffering. How can you hold together the love of God and all the suffering in the world? How can you hold together the inspiration and the stuff that we read? It's not easy. But what I've found is it's a bit like a crossword puzzle. Pepper and I sometimes do crossword puzzles. We're not very good at them. But what we've found is this. You, you start with the clues and sometimes you come across one, you just can't answer. But you don't stop, you move on to the next clue. And maybe that's a bit easier. And then you start to fill in a number of the clues, and that gives you the letters that you need to help you to understand the more difficult ones. And I find it's like that with the Bible. As I've wrestled with this stuff over the years, I've begun to understand more and more it's not that the difficulty is don't stay. I haven't finished the crossword puzzle yet. There's still things in the Bible that I'm struggling with. But I would encourage you to hold on, to believe that it's inspired by God, and to wrestle with the difficulties. And always remember that Jesus is the interpretive key. If it doesn't fit with Jesus, we have to say, well, how are we going to interpret this? Because Jesus is supreme love. And we know that he is the supreme revelation of God. If we want to know what God is like, he is like Jesus. So, it's 100% inspired and it's authoritative. Paul goes on to say this, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. In other words, it's our authority for what we believe and for how we live. And Jesus summed it up as being, God loves you, love God, love your neighbor. But then it's all full of lots of practical wisdom, advice, and guidelines for how we live our lives. It gives us boundaries. Some people say, oh, it's a rule book. I really don't want a rule book. That will take away my freedom. Surely if I follow this, I lose my freedom. But actually, we all need boundaries. Years ago, this incident is etched on my memory. When my eldest son was eight years old, he used to play in these football games on Clapham Common uh, with a whole load of his friends, and they were coached by a guy called Andy Busk. And what happened was, at the end of one term, they were going to have a kind of celebration event. End of term, two teams were going to turn up there. Andy was going to referee it, and uh, lots of parents turned up. Because it was 2.30 in the afternoon, it was mainly mothers and me. And I arrived, and Andy Busk had not turned up. So they looked for a referee. 
and no one volunteered from the mothers, so they press gang me. The trouble was, I don't really know anything about football, if I'm honest. I didn't even know the rules of football. And I didn't know most of the boys' names. I, I obviously knew my son's name, but I didn't know the, uh, a lot of the other boys' names. Uh, there were no boundaries there. There were no football pitches at uh, that time on Clapham Common. So we got some jumpers for goalposts, and we set out. I didn't have a whistle. So when people said the ball was out, I didn't know whether it was out or whether it was not out. Then people shouted foul. I didn't know whether it was a foul or whether it wasn't. So I just said, play on. <laughs> and eventually, this is actually true, there were about three small boys lying injured on the ground. <laughs> it looked like a battlefield. <laughs> At that moment, much to my relief, Andy Busk arrived. He had his whistle, he blew the whistle, he put the boys into teams, he knew all their names, he knew the rules, he told them where the boundaries were, and they had a great game. Question is this. Were they more free when there was no one in charge, there were no rules? Or were they actually more free when there was someone in charge and there were some boundaries? And actually, true freedom comes when we know that God is in control and there are boundaries. But you know, if children grow up without boundaries, they're insecure, they're unhappy. It's the same with us. Actually, the boundaries are given out of love. God didn't say, you shall not murder, because he wanted to ruin our fun. <laughs> he didn't say, don't commit adultery, because he's a spoil sport. He, he doesn't want people to get hurt. One man said, I don't read the Bible because it interferes with my work. He said, well, what, what's your work? He said, I'm a pickpocket. <laughs> This is God's love for us. He's given us this book. It's inspired by God. It's authoritative. It's the word of God. God has spoken. Secondly, this. God speaks. Relationship. The Bible is like a love letter from God. When you get a letter from someone you love, I always treasure that letter. Not because of the letter, because the letter itself is, is, is nothing in a way. It's because of the person who, who wrote it. And it's the same with the Bible. This book in itself is nothing. It's because of the author. And because the author wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. That's why it's precious. Jesus said this. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. He says, this book's all about me. And yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He says, the whole point of this book is so that you and I can be friends of Jesus in a relationship with him. That's the purpose. The book itself is only a means to an end. I have a, an old battered uh, Nissan car. I've had it for many, many years. I bought it secondhand years ago, and then I passed it on to my son, and then I passed it on to my daughter and son-in-law, who improved it considerably. <laughs> but supposing we were to get a new Nissan car, and it arrived, and there was a manual inside. And I got out the manual and went, wow! What a great book this is. And I started studying it, underlining it in felt pen, the bits that really interested me, tire pressures, steering. I thought, wow, this is such a great book. You know, we should learn this by heart. I learn certain sections by heart. Maybe we could set some of it to music. Maybe Tim Hughes could write some music for it, and we could sing some of this stuff. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe other people love the, love the Nissan manual as much as I do. Maybe there's a Nissan club I could join and talk to other people about my love for this manual. You know, obviously, Nissan, that, that's a Japanese. Perhaps I should learn Japanese so I can study it in the original language. <laughs> you think, well, that, that's not what it's all about. 
The point of the manual is to drive the car. The point of this book is to have a relationship with Jesus. And this is how faith comes. We look before at this verse. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. If you say, I want to have faith, read this book. In particular, I would recommend reading John's gospel. Because John says at the end of his gospel, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you might have life. Now, this is the whole point that I've written this gospel is so that you can have faith. And through believing, you can have life. For a friend uh, called Earl Smith. Earl Smith had far too much money. He was a cousin of Fred Smith, who started Federal Express, and Earl had far too much money. By the age of 30, he'd taken so many drugs that he ended up in hospital really sick from the drugs. While he was in hospital, someone came to visit him and gave him a New Testament, the Jesus bit. And he thought, this is great. It was very thin paper, perfect for rolling joints. And he rolled his way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, <laughs> And eventually he got to John's Gospel, and he started reading it. And through reading John's Gospel, he came to believe in Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus which totally changed his life. He was being looked after by a psychologist called Tommy. She was a very beautiful woman, a model, highly intelligent, very charming. But she was mystified. Because here was Earl, who was this drug addict, and suddenly he had this peace, this joy, this love, she said, I don't understand it. She said, you, you're in a total mess. You, you seem to be so at peace. She said, I've got everything, but I, I'm totally lacking in any meaning or purpose in my life. So he led her to faith in Christ, and then he married her. <laughs> and they were at theological college with us. That's how they became friends. I always remember his story. It was through reading John's Gospel that he came to believe. And over the last 40 years now that I've been a Christian, I have read this book practically every day. Not because I feel I have to, but because I love it. It's just like, why do I have breakfast every day? Because I like breakfast. I don't want to miss breakfast. And it's the same with reading the Bible. I read it because I don't want to miss it. To me, it's like spiritual food for the day. I read something that Rick Warren wrote about the Bible, and this really is my testimony. I could say all these things have been true for me as I've read the Bible daily over the decades. He says this, reading the Bible generates life. It produces change. It heals hurts. It builds character. It transforms circumstances. It imparts joy. It overcomes adversity. It defeats temptation. It infuses hope. It releases power. It cleanses the mind. So how do we hear God speak to us through the Bible? Well, may I suggest make a plan. Time is our most valuable possession. We can get more money, but we can't get more time. And may I suggest setting aside a maybe 15 minutes a day. And then a place. Jesus went to a solitary place. I have a, a solitary place that, that I go to. It's a particular place in a room where I go each day, and I, I go there expecting that God is going to speak to me. I go there with my cup of coffee and my Bible, and I'm praying that God will speak to me each day. And then find a pattern for reading the Bible. There are many, many different ways that you can do this. 20 years ago, Sandy Miller, who was the vicar here, Sandy gave me this Bible. This is the Bible in one year. So each day it has a psalm or a proverb, a bit of the New Testament, a bit of the Old Testament. And I loved it. It meant you can read the whole Bible in one year. And I've been doing that for, for, for 20 years. And, and recently, Bibber and I thought, well, maybe we should send out our thoughts from each day to the congregation. And then 
encouraged the congregation all to be reading the same passage at the same time. So we did that. And we sent out this email. It's now an app, the Bible in One Year app. And basically, each day I tried to find a theme. I started with a little story and then uh, various stuff, trying to explain some of the things, difficulties I had in explaining understanding various passages, trying to explain what I've learned over the last, whatever it is, 40 years, explaining what it means, and also, most importantly, how it applies to my life and to your life. And then Pippa puts her comment, very short comment, always at the bottom. If I had a pound for every person who said to me, I love the Bible in one year, but I don't read your comments, I just scroll down to the Pippa ads, <laughs> I would be a very rich man. But this is a way, this is a challenge, really. You know, if you start doing this tomorrow, in a year's time, you will have read the whole Bible. And that, whether you're a Christian or not, is an amazing thing to do. And it's a life-changing experience. I mentioned at the beginning that my father was 49 when he got married. And I was 25 when he died, uh, 21st of January 1981. I'd become a Christian uh, a few years earlier. And obviously, when my father died, I was devastated because I loved him and I, I, I missed him and I, I still do. He's an ama amazing man. But at the time, I was really worried also about him and you know, what had happened to him and the fact that he did he have a faith? He always described himself as agnostic. He was a man of few words. I didn't really know. And I was very uh, sort of disturbed by this. And it was 10 days later that I was praying and I was just saying, I was just asking God, Lord, please show me something about him. And I read this verse in Romans 10, which was the passage I was reading for that day, Romans 10, 13, which says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I felt like the Holy Spirit saying to me, your father called on the name of the Lord and he's saved. At that moment, my wife Pippa came into the room and she said, I, I've been reading the book of Acts and I think I've got a verse for your father. She said, it's Acts 2.21. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That verse only comes twice in the New Testament. I'd read it in one passage, she read it in another. Three days later, we went to a small group and we were studying a passage, Romans 10, particularly verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But such is my lack of faith and inability to hear God. I was still worrying about it the following morning. And I was practicing as a barrister. I was off to Woolwich Magistrates Court. And I never forget getting off the train at Woolwich Station. And I was still thinking about it, going around my head. And I looked up and there was a great big billboard which said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, verse 13. I remember telling Sandy Miller this story, what had happened. He said, do you think the Lord may be trying to speak to you? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you think the Lord may be trying to speak to you? And if so, will you let him?